Well, thanks very much, uh, Sir John. Great to be on a panel with you again. It's been all of about 48 hours since we last did this in Abu Dhabi, and I note it is a privilege. This is an individual who had more ambassadorships than I had stars when I retired, and a great expert on this region, needless to say. Uh, it's also a privilege to be on stage with Minister Sonora, noting what a wonderful partner and fin financial contributor Japan has been during the wars in Iraq and in Afghanistan. They sustained losses, uh, not known to many. Uh, in fact, it was fairly personal for me because when I was a two-star general in Mosul, the commander in the northern part of Iraq, two Japanese diplomats were driving up to meet me from Baghdad and were ambushed on the way in the vicinity of Tikrit, killed. Uh, and so Japan has taken losses in this war as well. And it was a privilege when I was in Tokyo two years ago to visit the memorial to those two fallen heroes, those two great diplomats uh, outside the ministry uh, in which you have your office. So thank you, Minister, for all that Japan has done and congratulations as well on the changes that you have made in recent years to be an ever better ally for the United States and indeed for other countries uh, around the world. Uh, John Chippen, Francois, congratulations on another successful Manama Dialogue. Uh, it just keeps getting better and better. It's a privilege to be back here some seven years since I last stood at this lectern as the commander of U.S. Central Command. And someone reminded me outside that that was the year where I made headlines by noting that the Emirati Air Force could kick the butts of the Iranian Air Force within two hours or less. Uh, and I want to stand by that statement and, in fact, given the experience that they have had when I was privileged to have them under command in Afghanistan and seeing what they have done in Yemen along with the other air forces of the GCC nations uh, in Iraq and Syria as well, uh, I will again stand by that assessment and note how impressive they are. But standing at this great podium here, um, having had to be my own speechwriter in this case, uh, one of the losses when you leave government, reminds me of a moment back in 1980 in Moscow uh, when Leonid Brezhnev uh, was preparing to welcome the world to Russia for the summer games. Uh, they were quite controversial, as you may recall, a few nations didn't actually show up. But he was determined, despite very ill health, uh, he literally got off out of his bed and a speechwriter took care of him. They ushered him up to the podium and put one hand on one side, the other on the other, put his reading glasses on, adjusted it, put the speech in front of him, opened it, and the speechwriter stepped back. And Brezhnev looked down and said, oh, and the speechwriter rushed back up thinking this was the big one. This was the heart attack they had all been fearing. <laughs> it was not. Uh, Brezhnev motioned him back, leaned down, Oh, the speechwriter rushed forward. He said in a whisper, Mr. President, that is the Olympic logo. <laughs> <laughs> the speech starts here. Well, perhaps I could start uh, in addressing the topic of this session, widening Middle Eastern security partnerships by revisiting the objectives that I think virtually all of us have uh, in this region, but inevitably, obviously, from an American perspective. Uh, clearly, what we want to do, and the Japanese minister, I think, highlighted many of these as well, to maintain the free flow of energy resources through the Gulf, despite what people may think, despite the U.S. energy re revolution and the fact that we are now the biggest natural gas producer in the world and the biggest oil liquids, that's more than just crude oil, producer in the world, it is still a vital U.S. national interest to have uh, maritime freedom of navigation for those energy resources, which still do fuel U.S. trading partners in the global economy, and that is thus still very important to us. Obviously, there's an objective to defeat terrorism, made ever more important by the rise of Daesh uh, by the continued presence of Al-Qaeda affiliates in the region. Preventing the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction remains very, very important. Countering Iran's malign activities that have, if anything, increased uh, in recent years, fostering instability in various countries in the region. Certainly deterring aggression uh, against countries of the region. 
strengthening partnerships throughout the region, including uh, the coalition of countries that is now from outside the region to perform missions that derive from these objectives and in general promoting security, stability and prosperity. Now you see the partnerships uh, that are working in various ways, most significantly in the fight against Daesh. This is one of the largest, if not the largest, coalition in history. It's over 60 nations now. It's approaching, I think, the number that we had in Afghanistan when I was privileged to command there. And as German Minister of Defense von der Leyen and U.S. Secretary of Defense Carter explained this morning, it is hugely uh, important and an effort that must keep in mind the five lessons that I described yesterday uh, in the session that we had to kick off this dialogue. In very brief, those are first, that ungoverned spaces in this region will be exploited by Islamic extremists. Second, the effects of those extremists will not be limited to the areas in which they're operating, so something has to be done about them or they will spew violence, instability, extremism, and a tsunami of refugees, not just into the regional countries, but beyond and all the way into the countries of our European allies. Third, that the U.S. has to lead the response. This is not optional. The U.S. has more of the assets that are proving to be the most important and enable us to carry out advise and assist missions in which we can support those host nation forces on the ground rather than our forces uh, having to be on the front lines, which is advantageous in a number of different ways and much more uh, proper in the, many of the countries in which we are engaging. But if you took all of the rest of the world's uh, unmanned aerial vehicles and other capabilities and multiplied it times six or seven, you would still not have the number uh, that the United States can bring to bear. And it also brings to bear enormous precision uh, munitions capability, precision targeting, and a bit, an ability to fuse intelligence on an industrial strength that is hugely important in trying to understand what the enemy is doing. It should always be in a coalition, however, and that coalition has to include Muslim countries, which is why Muslim hate speech and other actions uh, are harmful. Uh, and unhelpful. The campaign, the fourth lesson, it has to be comprehensive. It, the paradox uh, is that countering terrorist forces requires more than counter-terrorist force operations. You cannot just drone strike and Delta Force raid your way out of this problem. You have to have all of the elements that were present. For example, during the surge in Iraq, and I see a number of familiar faces from those days who understand that it's not just counter-terrorist operations, conventional clear hold build, it's politics, it's reconciliation, it's inclusive governance, it's rule of law, it's education, basic service restoration, reconstruction, and all of the rest that you know that are needed once you have a security situation that can be cemented by the addition of those elements. And then finally, and fifth, that this is a generational struggle. It is a struggle not of a decade, much less certainly of a few years, it is going to be the struggle of decades. We will have successes, we'll make progress, we will put a stake through the heart of Daesh in Iraq and ultimately in Syria, ultimately through the heart of Baghdadi. Uh, you cannot run a caliphate and not end up on the X sooner or later. But we cannot put a stake through the heart of the ideological caliphate that is out there in cyberspace and tragically still attracts some small number uh, of individuals who can cause very big problems by their actions as we have seen. Now, beyond the fight against terror, you see these partnerships in a variety of other ways. You see them in the maintenance of maritime freedom of action, navigation in the Gulf, as the Japanese minister noted, uh, the fight against the pirates around the Babel Mandeb and off the Horn of Africa, you see it in select actions to counter arms smuggling, terrorist movement, even financial flows to extremists. In developing further the capabilities on the ground, in the air, at sea, and in cyberspace of the countries in the region. And gradually, in knitting together the air and missile uh, defense early warning and defense capabilities, the subject of a superb IISS study that will be released uh, following this session uh, as I understand it. 
that is very, very timely, especially given the development of Iranian missile capabilities that we have seen uh, in the past year or two. Now, as always, there are organizational, there are communications, command and control, and there are intelligence architectures that have to be designed and established to enable unity of effort in pursuing the objectives I have highlighted. We have, of course, been working on this for decades in a variety of different ways. I pursued in a number of initiatives when I was privileged to command U.S. Central Command at a time when there were nearly 250,000 American military men and women in the Central Command region. And the key, it seemed to me at that time, and I think it still is, is turning very strong, hugely important bilateral relationships, of which Secretary Carter spoke this morning, into multilateral endeavors. We see that, again, in various of the missions I've discussed on the ground, at sea, in the air, fighting Daesh, fighting pirates, fighting armed smugglers, countering malign Iranian actions, and a variety of other missions. Often CENTCOM's relationships and structures can enable the sharing and partnerships needed now more than ever in a multilateral way. And indeed, that has to be, I think, the way of the future and is in line with that third lesson that I just mentioned, that inevitably U.S. leadership is absolutely vital. The truth is that what's going on indicates progress in the subject of this session of widening Middle Eastern security partnerships. And the privilege of having the Japanese minister here to underscore the importance of this region to his region, uh, which has grown so much and where much of the history of the future inevitably will be written but even that will be fueled by the energy and other resources that emanate from here. The truth is, though, that this has all evolved in a somewhat sporadic way. In earnest, when responding to a threat, obviously the Gulf War is the biggest example of that, but now the war against Daesh. And frankly, I think that the evolving threats that face the region now provide more than clear evidence of the need to further knit together forces and capabilities here and those from outside the region to work together more than ever before to ensure security and stability and prosperity in a region of critical importance to the world still. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, General.